The morning of July 15, 1881 dawned bright and clear. Already the humidity was heavy, and the mercury began to climb with the sun. It was typical for summer in south-central Minnesota, but the forces at work far above would prove to be far from typical. By the end of the day, towns and farms across western and central Minnesota would bear witness to an intense outbreak of tornadoes. A deadly F4 that tracked for over 40 miles would result in the worst damage documented that day. It would wreak havoc among farmsteads and destroy the town of New Ulm. The news of this devastation would capture the attention of the public, both in the region and across the country. But in the decades that followed, the story of what happened that July day would fade into obscurity. New Ulm, Minnesota is a small town settled in the Minnesota River Valley in south-central Minnesota. It was founded in 1854 by German immigrants and continued to grow as more families moved to the area. New Ulm became known for the multiple breweries started by the new residents. But life on the frontier was not easy. There was a lack of advanced technology, medicine, and communication, and in 1862, New Ulm was attacked by Native Americans twice during the U.S.-Dakota Wars. Leading into 1881, the winter to begin the year was harsh, and in February there was a minor earthquake felt by New Ulm's residents. In the months leading up to July, Native Americans had attacked small towns and farmsteads in the region, causing the population in New Ulm to swell to around 3,500. For a small town that had already experienced hardships, nature was about to deal them another deadly blow. Records from the U.S. Signal Service on July 15, 1881 show a low-pressure system located over northern Montana. The location of the low drew warm, moist air northward into Minnesota. This can be confirmed by accounts from residents of the region who remembered a southerly breeze throughout the day. Dew points in nearby cities were reaching into the 60s and low 70s when reports were sent into the signal service that morning. By midday, the temperature was reported to be 90 degrees in Ulm. This warm, moist air that was flowing into Minnesota and the Dakotas was perfect for the development of severe weather. Storms likely began to form in eastern South Dakota and western Minnesota near or shortly after midday. According to tornado researcher Thomas P. Grizoulis, the first tornado of the day touched down around 2 p.m. in Lacoparle County. It would kill four people near the community of Fairfield and move to the northeast through Big Stone and Swift counties. Grizoulis rated it as an F4 based on accounts of its damage. It was the only documented tornado that day to move northeast. As the storms moved to the southeast, the tornadic potential they possessed increased. Eyewitnesses in New Ulm recalled that around 3.30 p.m., thunder called their attention to a storm visible on the northwest horizon. Indeed, at that time, nearly 40 miles away, the vortex that would bring destruction to the town was beginning to take shape. It touched down just outside the small town of Bird Island, the western side of which took the major brunt of the storm. A few houses were reported to have been blown over, with many more losing their roofs. The tornado moved to the southeast, causing severe damage to several farmsteads in Palmyra Township. The tornado then began to approach Wellington Township. It was here where the tornado began to unleash its full fury on the Minnesotan farmlands. Reports state that beginning in Wellington Township, the damage path could have been anywhere from one to two miles wide. Farms and well-built homes were completely obliterated. Many times there was very little debris left on the property, some of it being strewn for up to half a mile. The damage to vegetation was extreme as well. Bark was stripped from trees, and one reporter documented that likely ground scouring was occurring here as well. Writing for the New Ulm Review, he said that all grain, corn, and etc. is destroyed, the ground being as clean as in early spring. A camp of railroad surveyors was struck. The men there held onto trees to avoid being blown away. Miraculously, they survived, albeit with one man having broken ribs and another with a broken leg. Near where one of the men had been caught during the tornado, a piece of timber was found lodged four feet into the ground. Unfortunately, other people in the area would not be as lucky. The farm of John Fahey was struck, and during the tempest his wife was severely injured and his three-year-old child was unfortunately killed. The tornado continued to Cairo Township and leveled the farmstead of Matthew Finley. The house was thrown from its foundation and scattered, some of the debris being found over a mile away. The Finleys at the farm survived, however, Mr. Finley's oldest son, age 12, was herding cattle in the fields. The tornado caught them in the open, and the Finley boy and all of the cattle were killed. Some of the livestock were thrown over a fence and found half a mile away.
Perhaps the most tragic example of destruction the tornado produced occurred at the Holliver farmstead. The damage there was immense. Like on other farms, the house vanished, with a reporter for the Bird Island blizzard stating that wagons, reapers, and all movable property were carried in many instances nearly half a mile. He also described that every tree on the fine large grove surrounding the house was as completely stripped of every particle of bark as could have been done with a knife. Sadly, the Holliver family was in the home at the time of the tornado. Joseph Holliver, his wife, and three of their four children were killed by the tornado. Only the youngest, a two-month-old baby, survived the disaster with a broken leg and a broken arm. In Severance Township, a man named Martin Fish was killed on his farm. He and his wife had been trying to hold the door shut, but him and the house were completely blown away. His wife survived, though she said that she did not know how. West Newton Township was next in line to be hit, and here the tornado may have reached its highest intensity. Everything in the center of the path was swept clean. The farm belonging to Fritz Loomis and his family was decimated. It took a couple of days for doctors to reach the farm and treat the wounded. Mr. Loomis, his wife, and one of his three children were injured. Tragically, the two other Loomis children were lost. The doctors that treated them claimed that the damage path was two miles in width at this point. At the time, West Newton was a small village on the Minnesota River. It was ravaged by the storm. Nine homes were leveled in the village, as well as a blacksmith shop, barns, and stables. Forty acres of trees were blown down during the vortex. Eyewitnesses in West Newton reported that the tornado consisted of multiple dancing funnels. This likely means that the tornado was a multi-vortex tornado. The Lornish house was one of those leveled. Three were badly injured, and the idle Lornish was killed. Martin Frank was found dead a half mile from where his house once stood. And at the time of the publication of the New Home Review report, five days later, Frank's home had not yet been found. By now, the tornado had crossed the Minnesota River and entered Milford Township to the west of New Ulm. The main building on a farm belonging to Mr. Williams was moved six feet off of its foundation. Granaries, homes, barns, and stables were demolished. Horses and cattle were thrown through the air and killed. Luckily, only a few people were injured in this area. For most of the tornado's life, it had been moving to the south-southeast, at an angle that would have taken it just to the west of New Ulm. It looked like the town might have been spared until it entered Milford Township. Shortly after crossing the Minnesota River at West Newton, the survivors from the destroyed village that it turned more to an east-southeast angle, the tornado had occluded. This new shift in its course put it on a direct path into New Ulm. Luckily, the people of the town had been preparing since the storm clouds began to approach the town. A reporter for the St. Paul Globe recorded the scene preceding the storm. Men, women, and children were affrightened and apprehending a severe storm, all set about securing their portable property outdoors. For half an hour, the people were kept between hope and fear. Hope that the storm cloud would not burst over the city, and the fear that if it did, great disaster would result. Shortly after five o'clock, the storm cloud burst. As the skies grew darker, a roar began to fill the air around New Ulm, until at 4.15 p.m., the tornado crashed in from the west, surging down into the valley. Three residences on the bluff above Howenstein Brewery were struck. The new brick house belonging to Julius Frank, unoccupied at the time, was leveled. The Eggert family's home was blown 150 yards into the trees nearby and scattered apart, some of the debris reaching a quarter mile away. Trees in this area were stripped of their bark or thrown, and shrubs, grass, and garden vegetables were ripped from the ground. Tragically, the Eggert's five-year-old son was killed instantly. Albert Eggert was gravely injured, and despite being injured herself, his wife crawled half a mile to get help for herself and her husband. Although Mrs. Eggert did find help, Mr. Eggert passed away a half an hour after the tornado. From here, the tornado seems to have briefly charted an erratic path, lifting the golden residence from the top of the bluff and smashing it into the side of the Hauenstein Brewery below. Several people were inside of the home as it soared downhill. Three children were thrown from the house onto the grass past the brewery. Miraculously, all survived with only one significant injury. Many people were working side of Hauenstein's brewery when the storm struck, and many lives would have certainly been lost had it not been for the quick actions of Martin Hose. Hose quickly urged most of the workers into the cellar, which was the only part of the brewery that survived without damage. Those who did not make it into the cellar found other means of shelter. A worker and two children hid in the fireplace's ash kettle among the hot coals. Another man crouched next to a safe. The falling debris landed against the safe, sparing the man's life. Worker Carl Nagel attempted to run to the stable, but was flung for several yards. He survived. 
The tornado again swung south, hitting the residence of John Howenstein, damaging it significantly. Max Hartnick was caught outside near the house and thrown. He flew up to 100 feet in the air before coming back down on the other side of the brewery with only slight injuries. After ravaging the area around the brewery, the tornado moved to the east-southeast towards the heart of town. The dark vortex impacted the north side of town first. Three churches were located on the northwest side of town and experienced varying degrees of damage. Other homes along the ridge were devastated as well. In a matter of seconds, the center of town was sent into a state of turmoil. Roofs were torn from buildings and chimneys collapsed. Horses and wagons flew through the streets. Sturdy brick buildings were damaged heavily, with some being destroyed. Wooden frame houses were flattened, and others were swept away. Thirteen people sought shelter in Mr. Vogel's new saloon. It was damaged to the point where only the lower floor could be identified. All of those who were in the saloon were injured, and one person, Mr. Fielder, died from their injuries. Elsewhere in the town, Eleanor Reitz and Annie Leash, both aged 10 years old, were killed by flying debris. An 11-year-old suffered a severe leg injury after being thrown half a block, but survived. The twister continued tearing through structures until it reached the Minnesota River. It traversed the river and shortly after dissipated, ending its 40-mile march of terror. Although the worst tornado of the day had finally ended, the outbreak had not yet run its full course. Three more tornadoes were recorded to have occurred that evening. An estimated F2 formed near Leavenworth in southern Brown County, causing damage to farms and trees. Two hours later, two tornadoes occurred almost simultaneously, almost certainly birthed from separate storm cells. The first of them began around 6 p.m., according to Thomas Grusillis. It destroyed several farm structures in Faribault County. The larger of the two originated just south of Mountain Lake and would produce up to F3 level damage. It killed several cattle and destroyed a farmhouse to the point that only one wall remained. The final event of the outbreak occurred at an unknown time the following day, striking the area of Boys Lake, the exact location of which has been forgotten, although it was likely southeast Redwood County or northwest Brown County. It thoroughly destroyed several farm buildings. Once this mysterious vortex dissipated, the outbreak had finally come to a close. But is this truly how it unfolded? With the records available to us, the tornadoes outside of the Newham Beast have been most likely given their best possible documentation in the eyes of modern standards. However, a typical narrative of a tornado coming over the bluff through the north side of Newham is flawed. The fact that derails this narrative is the location of Howenstein's brewery. As stated earlier, the typical timeline describes a tornado coming over the bluff, hitting the area around Howenstein's in the process, before then hitting Newham. That would make sense if the brewery was located behind the town to the northwest, but in reality, it is located more than a mile to the south. For Howenstein's to get hit, as well as the areas that were affected in New Ulm proper, the tornado would have had to do a near 180 to accomplish that feat. We know that the path had become erratic at this point, but the level of a direction change needed is mostly unrealistic. However, an erratic path may be a small piece in the larger puzzle. The most simple and likely solution to this problem is that there were two tornadoes impacting New Ulm at the same time. There are multiple points of evidence to support this. The first point is that Thomas Grizoulis does describe the event as a tornado family, suggesting multiple tornadoes in the same concentrated area. These tornadoes could either be satellites or twin tornadoes. However, the path of one of the other tornadoes mentioned parallels the main tornado, suggesting that it was a twin as satellites move around the parent tornado in arcing paths. Multiple sources from the day also say that multiple storms or funnels descended on the town, appearing at different points in times, but converging on Newham simultaneously. The paths and descriptions as such also support this. We can use a few landmarks and images, as well as a few statements from the Newham Review. The main landmark set we can use for determining a possible angle and intensity of the tornado as it entered Newham are the three churches. The Catholic Church to the north and the Lutheran Church to the south sustain moderate damage, having their steeples toppled and their roofs removed. However, the Methodist Church, located between the two, was completely leveled. The angle from the seemingly heaviest impacted area around the Methodist Church lines up with a likely approach angle and the epicenter of the damage downtown. In addition, an image from atop the Union Hotel, looking east, shows the damage path continuing on to the east-southeast towards the river. Also, just after describing the destruction to Howenstein's, the New Ulm Review states that the tornado spent its force on the timber between the brewery and the cottonwood, and then apparently went up into the air. This would put the ending point of the second tornado over a mile south than where we can see damage caused by the main tornado.
The twin tornadoes theory also makes sense when you begin to consider how the life cycle of twin tornadoes can work. Tornado families are often produced by cyclic supercells, which are supercells that produce multiple tornadoes. Twins can occur in cyclic supercells when one tornado is in the final stages of its life and dissolving, as the new tornado is gaining strength nearby. We know that as the tornado neared Duom, it occluded, causing it to turn towards the town. Occlusion typically occurs towards the end of a tornado's life. The comparative less intense damage to eastern Duom also suggests the tornado is on its way out. In order to explain the relatively quick dissipation of the alleged second tornado, the storm as a whole could have been cycling. The second tornado dissipates, the storm reorganizes, and then produces again. There is evidence that more damage was caused by the storm in Cottonwood and Butternut Valley townships to the southeast, as shown by the New Ulm Review and Monthly Weather Review. No matter how the tornado unfolded exactly, one constant remains. The devastation left behind. Forty miles of ravaged landscape and broken shambles that used to be farms were left for the survivors to clean up. Along the path to the northwest of New Ulm in Wellington, Cairo, Severance, and West Newton townships, the destruction was at its most intense. Entire farmsteads had vanished in a matter of minutes. Decades of work simply ceased to exist. Trees were debarked, and the ground was intensely scoured. Debris from the farmsteads impacted was windrowed and carried for distances of up to a half a mile or more. Immediately after the tornado had passed, lightning was still a substantial threat. In West Newton, John Kushnick's home was ruined, but his family survived in the cellar. He and his family emerged to examine the damage and assist others. However, he was struck by lightning and perished the next day. A similar event also occurred in New Ulm. After emerging from the debris, sisters Bertha and Wilhelmia Werner were struck by a bolt. Bertha was killed and Wilhelmia was significantly injured, but eventually recovered. The most extreme damage done in the vicinity of New Ulm was around the Hauenstein Brewery to the south. The remnants of the brewery were described as a shapeless mass of ruins by the New Ulm Review. Iron bars weighing approximately 80 pounds and 24 feet in length were thrown over a hill and dug deep into the earth. Two 400-pound barrels of pitch were thrown over 100 yards. In the Hauenstein residence, a nutmeg grinder was embedded solidly into the kitchen wall. The town itself suffered great damage, but it was comparatively less to the intensity of what occurred outside of town. Nevertheless, multiple frame homes were blown down entirely, and a blacksmith was leveled. Most brick buildings had their roofs torn away and some of their walls missing. In New Ulm proper, many oddities occurred. A man was blown from a drugstore and carried through the air for the better part of a city block, but remained uninjured. A young doctor's patient was resting on a lounge in his home. The home was carried over 200 yards and deposited on the other side of a large grove of trees. The boy was found unaware of what had happened. Despite suffering a broken arm, he thought he had merely fallen off the lounge. Downtown, one shop had its contents thrown into the store across the street. A millinery store was demolished and its owners survived in the cellar beneath. Elsewhere, a horse had been deposited in a tree, still alive and uninjured. A board had been driven through the brick walls of the Catholic school and into a teacher's desk. One last odd occurrence was that a wooden frame building downtown survived undamaged, despite all of the brick structures around it being completely destroyed. Almost immediately, relief efforts began. People began to dig themselves out of the ruins and tend to the injured. Within the first few days, debris was cleared and recovery began. The cost was high, at an estimated $250,000 in damages, but donations began to pour in. As word of the devastation spread across the country, individuals and groups did what they could to ease the suffering of the town. They sent money, clothes, and supplies. Chicago donated the most of any city, sending over $11,000. Closer communities sent manpower to speed up the rebuilding process. From all donors combined, New Ulm received nearly $50,000 in donations. Despite being hit hard themselves, the relief committee of New Ulm did not ignore the farmsteads and smaller communities in the area, assisting them the best they could. After 12 days, new houses were being built, and those that had suffered minor did moderate damage were mostly repaired. A reporter for the New Ulm Review described the scenes as follows. The city is one huge artisan shop everyone lending a helping hand to obliterate the storm traces and rebuild the city. New Ulm was beginning to heal, but a deep wound had been cut into the heart of the town. It is well known that time heals, but with the passing of time, so does the clarity of memory. In the 141 years that have passed since July 15, 1881, the events of that day have been largely forgotten. This storm holds no place in the public's imagination anymore, the only people who know the story today are locals who hold a love for their town's history 
or weather enthusiasts down a deep Wikipedia or tornado archive rabbit hole. It might be brought up by a wider audience on the anniversary, but it never carries far. Such is the fate of all tornadic events, it seems. As time marches on, devastating events slowly fade from the mind of the public. If you ask someone from the public to name a tornadic event today, more than likely they would respond with something along the lines of Joplin, El Reno, Mayfield, or more 2013. If you asked the same question 12 years ago, you would get answers such as Greensburg, Parkersburg, or more 1999. As time progresses, horrific events that should have a place in the public consciousness are forgotten when new disasters arrive, claiming the spotlight. This effect can even be seen in individual outbreaks. Many people know of the events in Tuscaloosa on April 27, 2011, but more often than not will not have heard the more powerful or deadly events elsewhere in the same outbreak. But the farther you travel back in the history books, the more obscure the events become. The story of the tornado in New Ulm gripped the public's imagination in the following weeks, and at the time was the worst to hit Minnesota. But that did not last. It was overshadowed by an even deadlier tornado in Rochester just two years later. Only three years after Rochester, the deadliest tornado in Minnesota history struck Sauk Center in St. Cloud. This goes without mentioning other major events happening outside of Minnesota. With so many stories seemingly so far out of reach, it is important to look back and remember. Times have changed and will continue to do so but we cannot forget the memories of those who lived and died in these storms long ago. Each tornado has a story, no matter how long or brief. All it takes is to spend time reading or listening to keep the story alive. The region has long since recovered from the devastating events of July 15, 1881. Much of the affected area remains open fields, with farmsteads dotting the landscape. Of course, things have changed, such as power lines and roads crisscrossing the land. Bird Island has grown, as well as Fairfax. Fairfax was platted the year after the tornado and incorporated in 1888. The tornado missed a small village in Wellington Township by roughly a mile. Today, the population sits around 1,200. However, the village of West Newton was on its way out. Bypassed by the railroad, the decline of the town had already begun when the tornado roared in. Surprisingly, though, it was not the final blow. After the tornado, the town did recover to a point similar to where it had been prior, but within just a couple of decades, it had just about faded away. The town's post office closed in 1910. Today, only one building from the original West Newton remains. Built in 1867 and closing in 1901, Harkins General Store remains a landmark preserved by the Minnesota Historical Society. Today, the town of New Ulm has not just recovered, but prospered. The population now sits above 13,000 people. The downtown area still holds the charms of times long past. Buildings such as the Union Hall still stand, and you can visit them. Hidden in plain sight are also reminders of the battle that preceded the storm by 19 years. The downtown area also has expanded since 1881, and the lots that were once piles of rubble are now businesses or homes once again. The area east of downtown today is less residential. Where homes once stood there is now a park, and the area along the river is now industrial. The three churches were rebuilt. The Lutheran church jumped to the opposite corner of the street, and the Catholic church moved across the street to the north, using the old church grounds to build a convent. However, the Methodist church moved from the corner of 3rd North and State Streets to the intersection of Center Street and Broadway, just across from today's Brown County Historical Society. New Ulm has not just grown in population since 1881, but perhaps more noticeably in the area. In 1881, the town sat on the edge of the river, the bluffs nearly a half mile to their rear. Now the entirety of the valley between the hills and the river is taken up by the town. Hauenstein's, once distant from the edge of town, is now tucked in the corner of a neighborhood. The current building was rebuilt on the same site as the original, and it continued operations for several decades. In 1969, operations at the brewery ceased, though the Hauenstein Brewer label continued to be produced. The old brewery remains as a historical preserve. The brewing spirit of New Ulm lives on at nearby shells, which was mercifully spared in 1881. Today, the city limits have spilled out of the valley. The town's high school, newest neighborhoods, and some of their newest commercial stores are located here. Near the high school is a municipal airport. Glandro State Park sits on the southwest side of town, and along Center Street, at the top of the hill, now lays Martin Luther College, as well as Herman Heights Park, perhaps the defining image of New Ulm. 
The Hermann Heights Monument was built from 1888 to 1897, beginning just seven years after the tornado. The statue atop the 102-foot monument is the third largest to be made of bronze in the country. It depicts Arminius, a hero of the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, and in 2000 the U.S. Congress declared it to be a symbol for all citizens with German heritage. Even then, his strongest connection is with the town around him, the locals today affectionately calling him Hermann the German, and he reflects the town itself. In his stance can be sensed a feeling of local pride. With his sword held high, it seems he could be saluting the town below, a town that faced many hardships, but a town that remained steadfast and eventually grew out of the disasters of its past.